Shoo, boy. That's a lot. History, antiquity. See also, travel literature. Travel outside a person's local area for leisure was largely confined to wealthy classes, who at times traveled to distant parts of the world. And white. Travel outside a person's local area for leisure was largely confined to wealthy classes, who at times traveled to distant parts of the world, to see great buildings and works of art, learn new languages, experience new cultures, enjoy pristine nature and to taste different cuisines. As early as Shulgi, however, I'm thinking more of like, if we're thinking of like more in like 1950s, granted again, there was plenty of people migrating and just going through different uh, different towns. Definitely like at the beginning of OG civilizations, of course, you know, people from Africa, migration and just there's, but tourism, like for leisure, I feel like that was very much elitist type stuff, AKA white sometimes. Learn new languages, experience new cultures, enjoy pristine nature and to taste different cuisines. As early as Shulgi, however, kings praised themselves for protecting roads and building way stations for travelers. Traveling for pleasure can be seen in Egypt as early on as 1500 BC during the Roman Republic. Spas and coastal resorts such as Bayi were popular among the rich. I stand corrected. <laughs> the Roman upper class, the Roman Shit. upper class used to spend their free- <laughs> Here I am thinking just like, I, again, no, it's still elitist, but all right. I mean, if it was going to be anybody, it was definitely going to be Egypt. Like Egypt's definitely going to be building the spas, the skincare, the massages. Like, yeah, totally. The Roman upper class used to spend their free time on land or at sea and traveled to their Villa Urbana or Villa Maritima. Numerous villas yeah. were located in Campania, around Rome and in the northern part of the Adriatic as in Barcola near Triessa. Pausanias wrote his description of Greece in the 2nd century AD in ancient China. Nobles sometimes made a point of visiting Mount Tai and, on occasion, all five sacred mountains. That's gotta be brutal though. Like you're still telling me that like people were still wanted to travel back in those days? Dude, fuck no. Like, what, what, no medicine? No medicine, no signs, no tour guide, no Wi-Fi? You're telling me that, like, oh, I'm just going to get my fucking sandals on? We're going to hop on a boat, take a month trip out to some fucking island? Like, granted, yes, I know it's royalty. Of course, they have the money to bring in all the food and, like, the servants and stuff like that. But fuck that. You died, like, you, know, you died sometimes because a stick cut your shin, and then next thing you know, like, what was it? You always heard about, like, Achilles. Just like, oh, he was a star athlete, and stuff like, a bitch, because you didn't have any fucking medicine back then. Like, no. <laughs> so, would you like to go to our villa? to go check out and to eat some grapes and stuff like that like no fucker like there's some mountain lions over there or villa's not properly secured there's no there's no guard like there's no like guard out there to like protect okay we haven't properly killed off the wildlife okay we haven't properly pushed out all the indigenous people out of the area and stuff like that there's probably tribes there waiting to burn the place down like, fuck no. Well, maybe. I mean, they probably did that did that because they had massive armies back then. So, And then Egypt with the whole slavery building the pyramids thing. So, maybe. Maybe. Maybe they already had the manpower for that. But still, fuck that. Yeah, what? I scraped my knee and then I had to get it chopped off? Nah. Nah. Fuck that. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. Yeah, well, let's see what's up with the Middle Ages then. Middle Ages. By the Middle Ages, Christianity and Buddhism and Islam had traditions of pilgrimage. Chaucer's Ooh. Canterbury Tales and Wu Chengun's journey to the West remain classics of English and Chinese literature. The 10th to 13th century Song Dynasty also saw secular travel writers such as Su Xi, 11th century, and Fan Chengde, 12th century, become popular in China. Under the Ming, Xu Ziyek continued the practice. In medieval Italy, Francesco Petrarch also wrote an allegorical account of his 1,336 ascent of Mount Venta that praised the act of traveling and criticized Frigi to incurio sitters, cold lack of curiosity. The Burgundian mm -hmm. poet Michael Tivan, F.R., later composed his own horrified recollections of a 1,430 trip through the Jura Mountains. Grand oh Tour. God. See also, Grand Tour. Modern tourism can the Jura Mountains. Sicilians. 
So, all right, subalpine mountain range, short distance north of the West Alps. A mini dem, dem, demarcate or uh, a long part of the French Swiss border, the east of the range, separate the Rhine. Room. The horrible regulations of a of a fourteen thirty trip. Jeez. Why do my ass think that like, oh, this is his 1400th, 1430th time through the German mountains. It's like, motherfucker, you're not, that's not a leisurely trip. Grand Tour. See also, Grand Tour. Modern tourism can be traced to what was known as the Grand Tour, which was a traditional trip around Europe, especially Germany and Italy, undertaken by mainly upper-class European young men of means, mainly from mm -hmm. Western and Northern European countries. In 1624, the young Prince of Poland, Ladislaus Sigismund Weser, the eldest son of Sigismund III, embarked on a journey across Europe, as was in custom among Polish nobility. He traveled through territories of today's Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, where he admired the siege of Breda by Spanish forces, France, Switzerland to Italy, Austria, and the Czech Republic. It was an educational journey and one of the outcomes was introduction of Italian opera in the Polish, Lithuanian Commonwealth. The custom flourished from about 1660 until the advent of large-scale rail transit in the 1840s and generally followed a standard itinerary. It was an educational opportunity and rite of passage. Though primarily associated with the British nobility and wealthy landed gentry, similar trips were made by wealthy young men of Protestant Northern European nations on the continent and from the second half of the 18th century some South American, U.S., and other overseas youth joined in. The tradition was extended to include more of the middle class after ale and steamship travel made the journey easier, and Thomas Cook made the Cook's Tour a byword. The Grand Tour became a real status symbol for upper class students in the 18th and 19th centuries. In this period, Johann Joachim Winkelmann's theories about the supremacy of classic culture be- Sorry, I just chuckled up. I just chuckled with this guy named Winkelmann. <laughs> This pioneer whose first article difference between Greek, Greco Roman, Roman art. <laughs> Artists, writers, and travelers, such as Goethe, affirmed the supremacy of classic art of which Italy, France, and Greece provide excellent examples. For these reasons, the Grand Tour's main destinations were to those centers where upper class students could find rare examples of classic art and history. The new. Yeah. A Grand Tour, that would be dope. So, what, it's just to hit up all these places, I guess? Yeah. Right. that's not too bad. I'm down. I'm totally down to check it out. Take a little bit of a gander on that one. Ship it up, bop, boot it, bop, deep. Sorry. I had to check on something real quick. Making sure the music was good. And so the New York Times the recently, New York Times recently described, described the Grand Tour in this way. 300 years ago, wealthy young Englishmen began taking a post-Oxbridge trek through France and Italy in search of art, culture and the roots of Western civilization. With nearly unlimited funds, aristocratic connections and months, or years, to Rome, they commissioned paintings, perfected their language skills and mingled with the upper crust of the continent. Close, Matt, Lessons from the Frugal Grand Tour. New York Times, the 5th of September 2008. That'd be dope if you could actually do I mean, like, that's kind of the ultimate goal for a bunch of travel people. But, oh, my gosh. <laughs> I like how it's just, like, months, even years. Just, like, yeah, because, again, you're traveling all through that rail, you know, rail and ship. God, I couldn't. Like, what, does it take two months just to get past the Atlantic? What is the average, like? what was it via ship how long how long would it take to cross let's just say the Atlantic and what was it well these are guys were like 18th century okay 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 so yeah 1700 Frank uh, Franklin discovered early on that he didn't suffer from sickness which was good as the perilous transatlantic crossing usually took at least six weeks and could take as long as two to three months just across the Atlantic. Yeah, you bet your ass a lot of these, Euro mm, I bet these Europeans just stuck within the same continent. And then at that point, then yeah, then you can just do a bunch of traveling. But if you're hopping on over to the Atlantic side, shit, that's a lot. 
That's a lot, peeps. Couldn't handle that much. Uh-uh. New, 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 new. So at least six weeks. At least six weeks. Dude, I'll lose my mind if I don't have anything to do. For, like, what do you do on a ship for six weeks? I guess read. I guess you just read a shit ton. That's something I want to, like, look up on, like... That'd be, like, a quick thing to do. I'll probably post it on on Twitter or something. Just, like, what what did people do on these long trips through? I want to figure that out about that. The primary value of the Grand Tour, it was believed, laid in the exposure both to the cultural legacy of classical antiquity and the Renaissance, and to the aristocratic and fashionably polite society of the European continent. In That's... That would make sense classical antiquity this period of cultural history between the 8th laid in the exposure both to culture oh so was all these rich people going around traveling writing in their books and stuff like that oh cool so hey you know what the rich did provide something they per they exposed the renaissance to us because how in the world were we able to get connected through all these pieces of art and stuff like that if it wasn't for these rich boys and stuff so you know what hey you be happy okay don't say that the rich never did anything for you i'm gonna stop talking on that part <laughs> the emergence of leisure travel okay oh look at this <laughs> I like that. That's funny. Look at this guy's face. I love it. So you see that? You see the shot that I did back there? Fucking hooped it right up. It's like, yes, dearie. I see it. Oh, no. No, fuck it. Yes, dearie, I do see it. I just can't hear you over my blood pants. They're so fucking loud. So, but now I fucking. Yeah, shot right over that. Yeah, he probably defeated him in the b-ball game. Just like, you, you, you failed me so many times. Just like, I love that. She's like, I can't believe I'm dating this fucking loser. <laughs> it's a very nice painting. That's pretty funny, though. Huh? Ah. Leisure travel was associated with the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom, the first mm. European country to promote leisure time to the increasing industrial population. Initially, this applied to the owners of the machinery of production, the economic oligarchy, factory owners and traders. These comprised mm. the new middle class. Cox and Kings was the first official travel company to be formed in 1758. The British origin of this new industry is reflected in many place names. In Nice, France, one of the first and nice. best established holiday resorts on the French Riviera, the long esplanade along the seafront is known to this day as the Promenade des Anglais. In many other historic resorts in continental Europe, old, well-established palace hotels have names like the Hotel Bristol, Hotel Carlton, or Hotel Majestic, reflecting the dominance of English customers. <laughs> Imagine, like, trying, like, being one of these, like, aristocrat-type people and, like, trying to explain, like, why you were gone for six months. <laughs> like, trying to explain to, like, poor work, more working-class people. Oh no, we took a trip. Just like for six months. It's like, yes, yes, yes. Yes, we took a leisurely travel. But well, like, what'd you do? Did you What did you have to go trade in different markets or something like that? They didn't have like a spice or something you need? Like, no, 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 no. We just Oh, we just ate, ate delicacies and just mandered about yes. So that, that sounds wasteful. That sounds stupid. What? Did you drink? Oh, yes, but only lightly. Didn't want to get too brandish. <laughs> and the most historic results. Of continental Europe. 
A pioneer of the travel agency business, Thomas Cook's idea to offer excursions came to him while waiting for the stagecoach on the London Road at Kidworth. With the opening mm -hmm. of the extended Midland Counties Railway, he arranged to take a group of 540 temperance campaigners from Leicester Campbell Street Station to a rally in Loughborough, 11 miles, 18 kilometers, away. Just like, just thinking just like, all right, we're already colonizing the world and invading, but now I want to see what we invaded and influenced. Yes, 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 yes. But I don't want to walk there, no. No, I don't want to take a ship either. Daddy, can you, can you have the people, can you have the people up top build a railway so me and my friends can go over to the people grandpappy enslaved and so i want to see all the exotic plants i want i want a monkey that goes ooh ooh so like, right son yeah so i'll talk to i'll talk to the united nations just say i want to see i want to see the ocean and all the yucky fish Right, son, yes. Or you'll have some of those other other people where it's like, just like, I want to understand all these cultures and stuff. And like, we must understand every which one of them. Or you could just be a, re a religious crusader and you want to push a religion on all the uh, tribal people out front. That's another way to do it. Either way. Either way. The rich bourgeoisie. And travel was very specific. I want to see the land we invaded. Mm. <laughs> That's funny. He's just sitting there, just like waiting. Just like, uh, I wish <laughs> that would be awful. That would be awful if just like one of the guys, one of the guys' servants, is just like, Where are you from, dear lad? Just like, um, I'm from. I'm from, I don't know, but it's a big touristy spot. That's not really touristy. Uh, Pakistan. Yeah, I'm from Pakistan. And it's just like, mmm, I never heard of the place. Where is it? And just like, it's. And he's just thinking, like, shit. Like, uh, it's nowhere. It's, it's, it's just down the street. I live right down the neighborhood. So like, no, I think that's a country. I've never been to that one. I may have to get there soon. <laughs> oh, God. With the opening of the extended Midland Counties Railway, he arranged to take a group of 540 temperance campaigners from Leicester Campbell Street Station to a rally in Loughborough, 11 miles, 18 kilometers, away. On the 5th of July 1841, Thomas Cook arranged for the rail company to charge one shilling per person. This included rail tickets and food for the journey. Cook was paid a share of the fares charged to the passengers, as the railway tickets, being legal contracts between company and passenger, could not have been issued at his own price. This was the first privately chartered excursion train to be advertised to the general public. Cook himself acknowledged that there had been previous, unadvertised, private excursion trains. During the following three summers he planned and conducted Ooh. outings for temperance societies and Sunday school children. In 1844, the Midland County's railway company agreed to make a permanent arrangement with him, provided he found the passengers. This success led him to start his own business running rail excursions for pleasure, taking a percentage of the railway fares. In 1855, he planned- Wow! So anyway, like, just one shilling? So he found the pat. This was- wait a minute. Cook was paid a share of the fares charged to the passengers as the railway tickets being legal contract. Shilling! A shilling is a historical coin. I'm just trying to figure out, like, arranged for the rail company to charge one shilling per person. This include rail tickets and food for the journey. Okay. I feel like a shilling's cheap, right? A fat and shilling. In 1855, he planned his first excursion abroad Pence. when he took a group from Leicester to Calais to coincide with the Paris exhibition. The following year, he started his grand circular tours of Europe. 
During the 1860s he took parties to Switzerland, Italy, Egypt, and the United States. Cook established inclusive independent travel, whereby the traveler went independently but his agency charged for travel, food, and accommodation for a fixed period over any chosen route. Such was his success that the Scottish railway companies withdrew their support between 1862 and 1863 to try the excursion business for themselves. Significance of tourism. Well, there you the go. tourism industry, as part... That's pretty crazy, though. Is that you just kind of got this shit together and then next thing you know, boom. People are moving all around the place. How, like, again, you're barely traveling in the areas. And, like, next thing you know, you're going, like, you're telling me that you're just like, yeah, dude, I went to a different fucking country. Like, what? It's like, what, like a country club or something? Like, no, 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 no. Like, dude, like, like you are not going to believe this. There are more people out there. Like, there's like a shit ton more people. So you see all the news and stuff like that. Like, what were you talking about? Like, what, are you talking like a hundred? Dude, I'm talking like thousands. Yeah. I'm talking like fucking thousands, dude. Like, you want I don't even think I can fucking count that high. Like, I know. Dude, there was at least a hundred people on the ship that I was going with me. Dude, I thought, like, dude, swear to God, I thought we were, like, we were on the ship going to... United um, United States stuff like that. I thought we were gonna fall off the well, fall off the edge of the earth. All right, I know that we've been burning people, so the world is round. But dude, I think I think it's I think it's legit. <laughs> like already thinking that like going to a different city is like travel, and now you're just accepting the fact that like oh yeah, like dude, there's like different countries. Which like like Europe again like a different country is just like a different state. It's it's all around. But again, people that like didn't know much about travel, their life existed within blocks of each other. That's wild. And then next thing you know, you're hopping on a train, and then you're going to something. First of all, completely different. Imagine seeing a tree that you never saw before. There was probably, you probably didn't even, like back in the day, you probably couldn't afford the picture book for that photo of that different tree that you didn't see, like a palm tree. Next thing you know, you're about to go, next thing you know, you're about to actually go to that specific spot. That is wild. It's dope. You know, I love travel. You just gotta do it ethically, which, we're about to figure out here on seeing the significance of what tourism